like to call the May 11th, can you hear me? 2020 regular board meeting this session to order. Uh, can we have a motion to approve the agenda with the amendment? I move to approve the May 11, 2020 regular board meeting agenda with, with the amendment, but I don't see the verbiage for the amendment. Is that good enough? To include updated personnel report. To include the updated personnel report. <laughs> This is Shannon. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, so first order of business is special recognition. Uh, we have a couple of, of individuals to recognize. Um, Dr. Lewis will go ahead and do that. We will start with um, Dr. Shakia Bland, curriculum coach. Yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I want to congratulate Dr. Shakia Bland, uh, who serves as a district um, curriculum coach specializing in math. She was selected for an Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellowship. Uh, Dr. Bland will serve next year in one of the United States Congressional offices in Washington, D.C. This is a huge honor. Um, she will be engaged in the national STEM education arena. You may know for the last few years, Dr. Bland has been consulting on the topic of inquiry-based mathematics and partnering with the Kansas State Department of Education as a culturally relevant pedagogy certified consultant. She has facilitated professional learning workshops throughout the state of Kansas. In addition, uh, a curriculum unit she wrote on the use of geometric modeling and food sustainability has recently been published. Uh, so she has her own textbook or part of a textbook um, high school mathematics lessons to explore, understand, and respond to social injustice. This was published in March by Corin Press. So we definitely want to congratulate Dr. Shakia Bland. I'm so proud of you for um, producing culturally responsive teaching and learning strategies in, in our district to support all of our educators and scholars in mathematics. Uh, Dr. Shakia Bland, is she on? Yes, I see her. Would you like to say a few words? Uh, just, um, I thank you for this recognition and I thank um, all the awesome educators in this district and the scholars I've had an opportunity to work with. And I'm just excited about this next opportunity and um, all that I will meet and all that I will learn. But thank you. See you in your car. You're not on your way to DC now, are you? <laughs> no, not yet, not yet. Okay. Well, it's <laughs> Certainly an honor. This is a huge honor. I think it's only one of one of fifteen in the country. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. So that's a huge honor for definitely for Lawrence Public Schools, for the state of Kansas, but for the country that um, Dr. Bland will be representing um, Lawrence Public Schools. And so, just uh, don't forget the little people. I know her. <laughs> so congratulations, Dr. Bland. We're super super proud of you. Thank you so much. And you have a, a round of silent applause there. <laughs> Thank right. you. Um, next, we have um, Valerie Schrag, um, the LHS social studies teacher, and some students. Yes, I'm Valerie Schrag. I uh, teach again at Lawrence High School. Um, and every year, my advanced placement history students um, have the opportunity to write a research paper and then potentially uh, turn it into a History Day project. Uh, Lewis High has a long history of qualifying students for the National History Day competition each year. And this year is no different, <laughs> despite the fact that um, regionals was held at Southwest Middle School in person. Then we went to virtual state. Um, six Lawrence High students competed at virtual state. And three of them who are here tonight with us are, um, they placed first in their category uh, to earn a bid to nationals. Uh, we will not be headed to Washington, D.C. this year, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, these students will still be competing and hopefully bringing some awards back to Lawrence. 
Um, I have asked each of them, um, each group, to make a short statement about their projects. This year's national theme was breaking barriers in history, and so their uh, their topics have very much to do with the theme of breaking barriers. So, Rachel Crambier, I'm going to ask you to make a first uh, statement for the title of her project was Breaking Barriers, the Stonewall Riots. Hi, I'm Rachel. This is my second year participating in National History Day and my topic was on the Stonewall Riots. If you don't know, the Stonewall Riots was a series of demonstrations by the LGBTQ plus community following a police raid targeting LGBTQ plus persons in 1969. Anti LGBTQ plus sentiment has long been a barrier and still is today. However, the Stonewall Riots opened a door for improvement. Ms. Shrog was definitely my biggest supporter during the entire contest, and I just wanted to thank you all for the recognition. So, thank you, Rachel. Um, our other national qualifiers were qualified. Uh, Rachel's was a group website, um, and um, our other national qualifier was uh, were Zora Lawton Barker and Lily Christensen. They had a group webs a group uh, documentary entitled Alvin Ailey Breaking Barriers in Modern Dance. Zora and Lily. Okay, so um, we did our project on Alvin Ailey, um, who was an outstanding modern dance choreographer um, in the era of Jim Crow. So it was very groundbreaking that he was able to succeed so much as an African American during those tumultuous times. Um, and we both have been fortunate enough to see Ailey's um, company perform. And so we both had an interest in him for a while. So when we found out the theme, it just seemed like a perfect fit. Um, and I think one of the most impactful and important things about Alvin Ailey, not only as an artistic creator, but also as a person, was how dedicated he was to uplifting those around him. He created numerous dance programs um, at either no cost or a very low cost to help um, those within his community gain an arts education. He also worked to uplift the voices of not only African Americans, but um, all Americans through his um, works. And he um, he really has been um, a very influential person in shaping the dance world and creating an inclusive environment for everyone. So I, as you can see, I'm phenomenally proud of these scholars. Um, I get to go along for the ride and get to be part of their brilliance. Um, so um, we they will submit their entries by the end of May. Um, we should have results by mid-June because of course everything is being done virtually here as well. Um, but I'm just very, very proud of these, of these scholars and these students. So well done, ladies, well done. And thank you for recognizing them. So. Thank you. Well done. I agree. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Lewis um, wants to recognize in, in honor of National Teacher Appreciation Week. Dr. Lewis. Thank you again. Uh, congratulations to those um, amazing scholars. As you know, last week was National Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, we appreciate all of our teachers every single day, but this year uh, was truly special, or is truly special. It has been gratifying to watch our teachers adapt and shine during these uh, last few months. They mobilized in minutes to respond to school building closures and stay-at-home orders as a result of this pandemic. They redesigned how we deliver instruction to our scholars and support our families. They have shown great care and compassion during this process for our scholars and their families. And they have been doing all of this while they were managing their own personal health and family caregiving needs and concerns. And I'll have to talk about those teachers that have children of their own um, that are still delivering online instruction to their, their classroom as well. Uh, our teachers definitely made me one proud superintendent. Our communication specialist, uh, Rachel Thomas, has put together several videos um, and released those each day last week. And like I said, you may have seen the many uh, different types of memes on social media from parents really just saying now I understand teachers what you're going through in the fall anything you want is yours uh, and I often say it shouldn't shouldn't take a, a, a pandemic for us to really for the country to really understand and appreciate the value of all of our teachers 
So uh, with that, I want to share this video in honor of all of our teachers in Lawrence Public Schools. You have Okay. Can I share my screen? Uh, no. You have, do you have your email pulled up, perhaps? I do, yeah. Okay. I can give this link really quick. I thought. Uh, Dr. Lewis, while we wait, and I'll share my favorite one. It's the one with the with the van and the writing on the van. It says, "You're you're lying. My kid is not a joy to have in the classroom." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's quite a few of them. It's one where it shows um, um, someone in an SUV that's pretty much almost throwing the kids out of the car and said, "This is how it's going to be the first day when school opens opens up in the fall." <laughs> Uh, I mean, but, but it, it really does. I think we have the video ready. I'll be quiet and let's watch the video. Just need some volume. Volume? Sound. There's no sound. No sound? No. Not we can. All videos are on our um, district YouTube page. Uh, you may have seen those uh, the videos that we're going to show tonight, or the one we're going to show tonight um, on our social media sites this week. No sound. Okay, I apologize about that. But we'll make sure um, that that video is posted again on our on our websites, our social media sites. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. I, I, I happen to watch it. It's a really neat video. Um, yeah, so we'll continue um, with the report of myself. <laughs> um, and I just, you know, want to echo again just like our appreciation for teachers I know I did a big shout out to a lot of my um, um, my ch my children's former teachers and current teachers just um, you know seeing both sides as an educator myself but just definitely the the impact that teachers have um, and they have had on my um, children's lives especially as a single parent and trying to navigate um the different milestones um as they progress from elementary to high school and on to, to college so um thank you uh along with that i had the opportunity uh, just with uh with lhs lawrence high school to um follow my senior down to receive their cap and gown and it was just so rewarding to see um, see the staff there, see teachers there, see, uh, you know, they didn't have to be there, but they were there uh, cheering them along as we went along the, the route. And um, I almost got a little choked up for a minute, uh, but it was just, it was just really neat. And I appreciate how, you know, again, the educators, the staff, the, the district leaders, how they are making the best out of uh, 
um, unfortunate circumstances still trying to give opportunities for our seniors to, um, to, to shine, you know, because they're missing some of the traditional things that we, um, they do and um, we take for granted. But so again, thank you. And I don't think I have anything else to report at this time. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Lewis. Okay, thank you. I have um, quite a bit to, to share. There's a lot of things going on. Um, first of all, our technology services um, has been examining the video conferencing tool WebEx that we're using tonight. I'm sure you have heard about the many security issues reported nationally with the free Zoom account. The district primarily has been using um, Google Meet, but we have allowed our staff who are more familiar, familiar and comfortable with Zoom uh, to use our licensed Zoom subscription. subscription. Again, we did not want to uh, force a new tool on our educators in the midst of um, uh, this pandemic. So those that were comfortable and familiar with Zoom, we did allow them to continue to use the, um, the licensed version, which was a little bit more secure. But um, so we plan to transition to WebEx uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's, it's a professional platform. It's a secure platform with unlimited storage, unlike Zoom. Um, it gives the host ability to lock individuals who should not be in um, our meetings, um, lock them out, mute participants, uh, chat with a single participant, use a whiteboard as a polling feature on their uh, breakout rooms and other options. Uh, while there obviously are risks associated with any technology, our in-house technology experts feel that WebEx uh, will best meet our needs. I wanna thank all of our students, parents, and staff who participate in our continuous learning survey. Uh, we continue to review the feedback and make adjustments as needed. We did get a lot of positive feedback uh, from parents. We did get some feedback from um, mainly high school students still feel like uh, it's, it's a lot of work on, on them. Um, so we continue to make those adjustments uh, and, and forward the survey on to our, our schools and mental health teams. We also have summarized our findings for a report and submitted it to ASDE. For the governor's framework uh, for reopening Kansas, district staff will continue to work from home in May during phase one. Upon the direction of their supervisors, some staff members may be asked to come to the office to perform some essential tasks. We have a process in place for our staff to follow to ensure that all public health guidelines are followed. For example, staff will sign in. Uh, they will answer the CDC uh, personal health questions and follow state regulations, including having no more than 10 people in one space, observing six feet physical distancing from others and wearing masks or facial coverings. We have two weeks left of, of school. Teaching and learning will continue through May 21st, but our schools will begin announcing schedules for students and staff uh, to begin the year-end checkout procedures. This will include appointments to return district items such as textbooks, library books, uh, instruments, uniforms, et cetera, and times also to pick up personal items. Again, we will also follow the public health guidelines during this process. We have committees including teacher representation, a meeting to discuss summer and fall programming. We also are in constant communication with our Boys and Girls Clubs of Lawrence and working with them uh, on their plans as they relaunch and begin reopening on June 1st. Technology Services, again, uh, is offering device pickup, repair and replacement, and return at the ESC by appointment only. Staff and families may make appointments by calling our help desk. Again, that number is 785-330-HELP. The community partnership that supports our local restaurants while feeding children 18 and under asked to continue serving meals through May 23rd. We appreciate those 10 local restaurants and the many, many volunteers that have showed up uh, and uh, volunteered and provided free breakfast and lunch curbside pickup from 11 to 1 um, at uh, Hillcrest, Swegler, Liberty Memorial, and Billy Mills. Again, those times are from 11 to 1. Our food services staff uh, are excited to resume meal services May 26th through the 29th. Uh, that's the week after school ends. We didn't want that dead week in between that and the start of our summer feeding. So our food services uh, staff will pick that up. And our summer uh, food services program will begin on June 1st. And those details will be announced soon. Team, um, St Team STEAM Robotics the Lawrence College and Career Center's first robotic competition team announced that Lawrence High Junior Ryan Roberts 
has been recognized as one of Central Missouri's um, Regional Dean's List Award finalists. Uh, the Dean List uh, recognizes outstanding sophomores or junior team leaders who respond to uh, spread first first messages, I'm sorry, first messages for a gracious professionalism, cooperation during competition to their community. Ryan also has personally set up outreach events with area middle schools and the public library, helping spread excitement about STEAM education and robotics to Lawrence Elementary and middle school students. Congratulations to Ryan Robertson. Roberts, I'm sorry, Ryan Roberts, I gave him a new last name. Uh, the Lawrence School Foundation presented its Spring Ace Awards to Michelle Barnes, uh, who's Woodlawn Parent Involvement Facilitator, and Lisa Spencer, Sunset Hill Library and Media Assistant. Both staff members also received $500. Congratulations to both of those staff members. Uh, Kelly has acknowledged staff retirements. Um, she normally does that uh, at, at each one of our board meetings. Uh, but I want to publicly thank all of the 55 teachers and classified staff who are retiring um, in a few weeks. Uh, we definitely appreciate their commitment, their dedication, their many years of service. I understand, I think there was one um, educator that has served uh, over 40 years. And so we definitely appreciate all of the many years and the many lives that each one of these educators uh, have touched. We wish, wish them well um, during this retirement and we will be mailing our retirement staff a special token of our appreciation but we certainly wish we could do that um, and celebrate them in, in person. Uh, today, I shared a video message that included an, an announcement of our uh, graduation plans. We have shared our plans with community public health officials. I talked personally to Dr. Marcellino, uh, the county health, um, county health officer, and they feel that we have a solid plan to celebrate our mighty class of 2020. So again, Lawrence Virtual School will host this, host this graduation at 1 p.m. July 11th in the Freestead Auditorium. Uh, both high schools will share their respective school, uh, share with their respective school families, uh, special no contact ways that they will mark the original graduation dates, which were May 19th and 20th. Freestead graduation will be held at 8 a.m. 8 a.m. July 18th in the Firebirds Campus Stadium. Lawrence High School graduation will follow at 10.30 a.m. Uh, the same day, July 18th, in the Chesty Lions Campus Stadium. Again, we will be announcing those specific instructions for graduations in order to meet all health and safety requirements. And this will, for the first time, I think, ever um, include limiting the number of guests per, per graduate. We know everyone understands uh, our reasoning for, for doing this, uh, which is certainly to meet those physical distancing guidelines. In the event of rain on July 18th, uh, we will host drive through graduation parades and this was the second choice of our seniors and families who responded to our um, survey. Uh, as you know, during this pandemic, all plans are subject to change. Hosting our graduation ceremonies will require us to move forward through the governor's phases of reopening Kansas. Uh, moving through those phases depend on all of us. I encourage everyone to continue following those health and safety recommendations to um, make sure we decrease the spread of COVID-19 and can celebrate together in July. Uh, and lastly, about three hours ago, my wife and I were sitting at home and um, our two oldest daughters surprised us. They drove all the way from Alabama uh, to surprise us. And so I'm sure they're all at home around the TV now watching uh, this board meeting. So I want to say hello to Jasmine and Akira and they came with a couple of friends too. Welcome to Lawrence. This is our first time in Lawrence. And so we are super excited for the first time ever to have all of our children here uh, with us in Lawrence. That's all I have. This is the hard part of muting and unmuting. <laughs> um, oh, that's that's really neat um, to have your family all together. So at at this time, um, we will have. Do we have any patron commentary? I did not receive any patron commentary. Thank you, Elise. So we'll move on to board commentary. Melissa, this is Shannon. I just had a couple of things. Um, first of all, I wanted to um, say thank you to all of our educators. I know as the parent, I have great appreciation for everything that you are doing um, with our students. Um, so just wanted to um, share my appreciation. Um, wanted to just share with the board, I participated in the KASB um, 
board leadership for uh, events that are being held uh, weekly on Wednesdays, uh, the last couple of weeks. A um, lot of discussion about um, issues related to contracts with employees, particularly supplemental contracts for, for teachers and staff that coach and do other activities. Um, just uh, their, their legal staff is trying to provide guidance to board members across the state about how to um, approach those, uh, particularly going forward, not knowing for sure what activities will be um, taking place or not taking place possibly next year. And then uh, they shared an update on the Acacia guidance that was just released regarding um, summer activities for our student um, athletes. Um, and so that was very interesting. I'm looking forward to this week's session. I believe there's going to be some additional discussion about uh, what people are talking about across the state in terms of what our school year might look like next fall. And uh, that's uh, something that we had some small group discussion about in the last uh, one of those events last Wednesday, but um, you know, lots, lots more questions than answers at this point. So um, anyway, just wanted to share that and, um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Anyone else? Uh, yes, um, I will go. Uh, this is Carol Kadu Blackwood. I'm, uh, I'm fortunate I was able to attend some of the KASB meetings with Shannon. Yet, and yes, there are more questions than answers. And it's just it's ever developing. We just have to always shift and pivot with the, the coronavirus. But um, I would like to thank the educators of this district for being able to just accommodate and just just um, work with our students. And I'm seeing that the, you know, just a lot of wonderful things. Like the, the teachers of my daughter's teachers are going above and beyond for my, my two daughters who attend LHS. And we picked up my daughter's cap and gown from Lawrence High School. And I was, and, and I'm with Melissa. I was moved to tears because we drove through the parking lot and got jo we got JoJo's cap and gown. And the teachers and the staff, they were cheering for us. So that was really beautiful. Yeah. And, I, and I distributed sack lunches during, the, this, during this time. I've been to every site. So this is what I've been doing about three times a week. I just kind of just go to each school, make my round. But I want to commend the district and the, the community. The, the, the whole community itself just turned the bus, you know, on a dime. Mm -hmm. So it's just wonderful to see everybody just stop and pivot and just support our students mm -hmm. and, our, and our families. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Melissa. Yes. This is Paula. Um, I would just like to say a couple things. Um, congratulations, seniors. Um, I wish you well in everything that you do. Um, and congratulations to Winona Ione. She is my fourth senior going through. <laughs> so I am <laughs> very familiar with the whole graduation process. This is very, very new for her and for me. Um, so it's been really interesting. Um, so I, I hope all seniors um, do well in their endeavors. Um, uh, I attended the EAC, the Equity Advisory Council, um, this last couple of weeks, and it was mostly an update from Dr. Lewis uh, and Anna about what has been happening in terms of um, continuous learning plan. Um, that was that was that, and I also. Um, uh, I had the opportunity to work with the Sunrise, um, the Sunrise uh, project, and I was really pleased to hear that um, they are still going forward with their farm to school program. Um, so they are able to get those um, the community gardens up and going, so that um, students and community members have access to free and healthy foods um, this summer. So that was exciting to hear. That, that partnership is going um, is going well, and um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. I have something real quick, um, Melissa. Sure. So I also like to congratulate um, our seniors. Um, congratulations, and also thank you to all of the educators for doing an amazing job. Um, I can't imagine what you had to go through to make everything as successful as it has been, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, just a couple of things. I did attend the, the uh, along with Paula, the um, Equity Advisory Council meeting, um, received an update from Dr. Lewis and Dr. Stubblefield. Um, we touched base on 
a few equity issues in the virtual environment and also discuss some possible solutions. Um, we discussed some board actions that to help to move equity work forward. Uh, excuse me. Oh, sorry, I thought I heard someone say something. Uh, we also discussed leveraging a local partnership with the Boys and Girls Club um, to lessen the students' academic loss due to, um, as Dr. Lewis refers to, the summer slide and the COVID slide. And then also um, we discussed our plan to start meeting regularly. I also attended on May um, 6th um, the Free State Site Council meeting, and we discussed things um, that included the annual report, um, the continuous learning during COVID-19, um, and also the learning, the survey um, that the parents took, um, and then the graduation, although we didn't disclose any specifics, we didn't discuss um, the possibilities for graduation, and that's it. Thank you, Erica. Do I have any other board members? Uh, I just need to update folks on negotiations unless you covered that. No, did not. Okay. Um, so uh, GR and Melissa and I uh, were at a negotiations meeting last week and things are going along well. Um, this is the time of the year for new board members where we start to, to get to a space where we are creating resolution around what the contract might look like for next year. So I'll just say you can attend um, the uh, virtually the next negotiation meeting, which I think is a good exercise, particularly if you might be rolling on to negotiations as a committee um, in 2020-21. Uh, so the next meeting, I believe, and maybe Dr. Stubblefield can correct me if I'm wrong, is um, Thursday, May 14th at 5 o'clock. Um, and if you participate, I think the biggest thing to know is uh, Melissa and GR and I are in conversation about negotiations, so um, we can't talk to you and, and you, uh, we ask that you not participate in the meeting, but observing it in, in my role as a new board member was very helpful. So I would encourage you to do that um, and just to be good partners to the LEA if you have time to do so and to our administrators who work really hard to create a, a contract that's strong and um, helps protect the teachers' interests and the district interests at the same time. I agree. Anyone else? Okay, hey, Dr. Lewis. Well, yeah, I just had one more thing. Um, we haven't had a chance to look at our May newsletter. Uh, that was in the Lawrence Journal World and um, in the Cray magazine that was possibly sent to all your, your doorsteps. Our communication team did an amazing job of that. If you haven't looked at it, or if you have looked at it and you've maybe passed by this picture, this cartoon of me with the mask on, um, there was my message. But what I want you to pay close attention to is I highlighted several um, of our staff, community members that are doing some phenomenal things during, during this continuous learning plan. So the newsletter just talks about our continuous learning plan, our strategic plan, our, our redesign, you, which you'll hear more from that uh, tonight. But this through, this through this pandemic, as I mentioned, our teachers have just really um, just shined in a, in, in a way that was this, that's just been phenomenal. From Hannah Hurst, the art teacher, who's been featured um, on, on local news, and uh, Randy Watson at our superintendent's meeting on Friday, um, Shared, shared the link uh, in the Zoom with over over 300 superintendents. He said, if you haven't seen uh, this article that was in the Lawrence Journal World about Hannah Hurst, please take a look at it. She's been on KM, KMBC um, News in, in Kansas City. But that those are just examples of our teachers and staff that are uh, just being creative and going above and beyond to, to make the best of this our current um, circumstance. Um, I will share that my child's third grade teacher, Ms. Yoder, delivered a poem, a note, and along with some M&Ms to each student's doorstep, to each student's doorstep. And so that's just one example of the phenomenal work that our staff um, is doing you know, during this time. So I just want to, again, highlight how proud I am to work with such talented and, and, and dedicated educators. That's all I have, Ms. Listen. Okay. I love hearing these stories. It just warms my heart. So 
Now, um, may I have a motion to um, approve the consent agenda? I'm, I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Carol. Thank you, Carol. Can I get a second? Is it GR second? Jones? Oh, I think. Can we skip her? I think she's circled. Could do black, could do Blackwood? Yes. Gordon Ross? Yes. Hill? Yes. Kimball? Yes. Smith? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Jones? All right. Motion passes 6 0. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think she was going to do the retirement. But I will attempt to do that. I know Dr. Lewis did um, announce the, the retire, um, a shout out for the retirements overall. And we have two retirements on a personal report. Susan Arho um, of paraeducator at Kennedy and Ann Major from Quail Run, instructional um, assistant in math um, for their years of service. And we, again, wish you the best on your future endeavors. So I will say congrats to them. And then we will now move on. I'm excited for this. Um, uh, update from the school, from the redesign team, we have. Mel Melissa. Oh, sorry. Yes. Can I, can I make an introduction uh, before we get into the report? Oh, yes. Yes, I apologize. Okay. Not a problem. Not a problem. We um, uh, I thank the board for approving the consent agenda. Within the consent agenda was the personnel report that included um, a couple of, a couple of new, new administrators to the district. And we have asked those new administrators to join us tonight. Um, if the board did not approve the consent agenda, I just kindly asked that they push the X and exit out of this. <laughs> so thank you so much for uh, approving them. Um, so we do have, like I said, those administ some administrators with us tonight. Um, are Heather and Matt Rink with us? Yes. 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 Awesome. Welcome to the both of you. Um, Heather will lead Broken Arrow as uh, its new principal starting in July. Heather is a pre-K through second grade teacher at Atchison, Kansas, and previously served four years as a pre-K through eighth grade principal and athletic director in Nortonville. She also taught and served as a school counselor for seven years in Raleigh, Marysville, and Salina. Salina. Uh, we are excited to have you join our team, Heather. Uh, would you like to say a few words? I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. I'm excited to be a part of Lawrence Public Schools. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have Matthew Rink. Uh, Matthew Rink will join our Free State High School administration as assistant principal. Just in case you're wondering why they're in the same room together, they're actually <laughs> in life. Um, Matt is completing his fourth year as principal at Atchison High School. He previously served as, served as an uh, assistant principal and athletic director for two years in Atchison County Community uh, Junior in senior high school of Effingham and taught English and journalism for 14 years uh, at high schools in Atchison, Salina, and Raleigh. Welcome, Matt. Would you like to say a few things? Thank you. Like, like Heather said, we're, we're both very excited to join the, the Lawrence Public Schools family. Awesome. Welcome. Yes, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. If you were here in person, you would get an opportunity to go around and shake every board member's hand. I don't know if that's even going to be a possibility in the future. So uh, we will definitely uh, like to welcome you to, to Lawrence Public Schools and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. And we'll definitely see you soon. You're more than welcome to, to hang out uh, here at the board meeting as well. Um, Sarah Cruz, are you with us online tonight? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. We want to, we want to welcome Sarah as a new principal of Hillcrest Elementary. Um, Sarah is completing her second year as assistant principal of Brookside Charter School in Kansas City, Missouri, where she served two years as an instructional coach and six years as a teacher leader. Uh, since 2016, Sarah has participated in a, uh, in a selective residency 
with the Kansas City uh, Plus or Kansas City Pathways to Leadership in Urban Schools, uh, which is a leadership development and principal preparation program uh, for educators who want to become true transfer transformational school leaders. And it's a very intensive process. Uh, we're excited <laughs> to have you join us, Sarah. Uh, would you like to say a few things? Yes, thank you. I'm excited to join this team and I cannot wait to move there and, and officially meet you all. I haven't even been in the building yet. <laughs> well, welcome. Yes, thank you. We do understand that you will be moving mm -hmm. to Lawrence, so we can't wait to have you here in Lawrence. Thank you for being with us tonight. Um, let's see. What about Andrew Taylor? Dr. Andrew Taylor, are you online tonight? I am, Dr. Lewis. All right, we're three for three. There we go. All right. <laughs> we want to welcome Andy as a new principal of Billy Mills Middle School. Uh, Dr. Taylor is completing his seventh year as an assistant principal for Kansas City, Kansas schools. Uh, he previously taught in the Blue Valley School District in Overland Park for seven years uh, and in Olathe schools for three years. Uh, Dr. Taylor, we look forward to you joining our leadership team. Uh, would you like to have a few words? Just a, a very simply, just want to say thank you for the opportunity. I could not be more excited. Just sincerely, thank you. All right. Thank you. And thank you and welcome. Yes, thank you for joining us tonight and we will definitely see you soon as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's always difficult to lose high quality, uh, high caliber principals, either to retirement or to other professional opportunities. And we certainly appreciate the many years of dedicated service uh, from Brian McCaffrey, Lisa Boyd, Tammy Becker, who's on with us tonight, uh, who's just been uh, phenomenal here in, in Lawrence and in this community, uh, and Dr. Keith Jones. And we wish you all well in, in your future pursuits. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we will have an update from the school re school redesign um, team. Dr. Subberfield, are you? Yes, I will. I think Dr. Lewis or Joe, someone there is navigating. Yes, the Joe is. All right. Okay. Okay. I'll wait till he. Well, I can talk while he's pulling it up. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see everyone that I can see on the platform and hello to everyone that is watching. Um, this is an exciting time um, for our schools in Kansas. And um, as, um, Joe, you can go to the next slide. As um, our some of our board members know, but I'll give a little background for our new board members. Um, last spring, the board approved for four of our schools to participate in the Apollo redesign uh, process. Um, and those four schools will present to you tonight. Um, Jim Kimball, who retired um, in December, was the point person for this initially, and she handed the baton off to me. But I've been engaged um, with all of the schools as they've gone through the process um, this past year. Um, one of the things where we started was we gave the schools the parameters to which to operate but we did not want to stifle their creativity and from the very beginning um our schools did something a little different we got approval from the um, kansas state department of education to work in conjunction with greenbush and the think wrong um project um to talk about our design process so the parameters that we gave the schools were around um, curriculum assessment and resources. Um, curriculum being we have priority standards that have been identified in our um, content areas. And we just told the schools as they think about curriculum, we have to think about um, what our priority standards are so that we can ensure what's in the strategic round of, uh, plan around guarantee and viable curriculum. Um, is not lost in this process. And the other area was assessment. And as far as assessments, as far as district common assessments, as we need to develop those along with state assessments, um, all of the schools will um, continue to partake in those assessments um, because that will allow us to have um, evidence of the growth that the students are making as the schools start to implement their uh, redesign uh, proposals. And then the area of resources. We know that during this time, and especially now with the pandemic and the uh, 
forecast for funding. We just told all of the schools to operate uh, within the resources that are already currently uh, allocated to their schools. So <laughs> those resources and be creative um, within that. So those were the parameters that they were operating in. And if you've had a chance to read their written reports, you will see that they did a, a fabulous job of being creative and really rethinking what school can look like in a lot of areas. Um, one of the things that caused all of us to pivot was COVID-19. Um, and our redesigned schools were uh, positioned for that, but all of our schools had to do it um, immediately. A, a lot of them were preparing to really test out um, a lot of their uh, proposals once we returned from spring break. And obviously a lot of it had to be pushed, uh, put on pause. The state did make adjustments and instead of having them to present in May in order to be uh, to give everyone an opportunity to continue to test their um, prototypes and to take uh, make small bets around the things that they are proposing that's going to be extended into the fall and um, all of our schools sh should be prepared to launch um, in January of 2021. Um, some of them um, are a little further ahead than others, and but they all will continue to implement things in the fall and they all are taken into consideration. They may not have had a lot of time to think about it or plan, but what school may, how school may look different in the fall and how can they test out those prototypes. And I'm sure they'll talk about that in their um, updates tonight. Um, the last thing I will say, and then I'm gonna turn it over to our first school, which is Broken Arrow. Um, Going forward next year, and I'll talk about next steps more at the end, we are in the process of working with LEA um, to have a Apollo 2 launch, and we're only looking at the middle school because we don't currently have a middle school that's a part of the redesign process. And this was done intentionally because some of the lessons that we learned as a district is systemically, this takes a lot of support and resources and finding, um, allocating the time for the schools to have time to plan and uh, professional development around it. So in order to not um, expand more than we can support as the district, we're just opening it up to middle schools and we'll um, have a process for those middle schools to vote online to see um, which, if any of them, will vote to uh, come on board. <laughs> That is the last thing I will say. And unless there are questions for me, I will turn it over to Broken Arrow. All right, good evening, everybody. This is, my name is Brian McCaffrey. I'm the principal of Broken Arrow. And I'm gonna introduce two incredible ladies, Amanda Green, pilot, and Bailey Failer, our co-pilot. And tonight, uh, Amanda and Bailey are going to update and highlight Broken Arrow's why, our vision, and our five goal areas. Our five goal areas are primary supports, flexible learning, social emotional supports, learning focused scheduling, and student behavior supports. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda and Bailey. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Amanda Green, and I am the learning coach at Broken Arrow and also the pilot for our redesign work. Um, Joe, if I could have you go back just one slide for me. Um, we're going to start. I know that in the fall, um, when we gave you our last update, um, we were just starting out with this process of identifying and solidifying our why statement and also our vision. And so we wanted to start there. Um, obviously, I hope that you find um, the written report to be detailed and to provide you with a lot of information um, as questions arise. But the why statement was really where we started. Um, it was a real collaborative process amongst all of our staff. Um, we first had staff write down their individual whys, um, and then we did a collaborative activity where we were able to find um, a lot of similarities um, and we're able to come up with this overall why statement that was then voted on and um, is always something that we continue to come back to through all of our redesign work. 
So our why statement at Broken Arrow is to create a student-focused environment, both physically and socially, in which students will receive meaningful interaction in order to foster a passion for lifelong learning. And then we moved on to our vision. And with our vision, we really wanted students to be involved and also for it to be student friendly, something that would stand the test of time and would stick with Broken Arrow um, for many years to come. And so we had come up with the idea about Broken Arrow Eagles SOAR. And um, we asked for students to come up with ideas for each of the letters in SOAR. We had staff come up with ideas. And then again, we engaged in a collaborative process to um, narrow down those ideas and also get community feedback. So we had students vote kindergarten through fifth grade. Uh, we had parents vote at parent teacher conferences in the fall. Um, and then we had staff vote as well in order to come up with Broken Arrow Eagles succeed, overcome, apply and reflect. And um, I don't think I could be more proud of the words that are there on SOAR. Um, I think it really allows um, us to go connect back to our why statement and really think about um, lifelong learning as we apply and reflect, um, overcome and succeed, which I feel like is very true right now during this COVID-19 time. All right, Joe, if you want to go ahead, we're going to walk you through each of our goal areas. Again, you'll find a lot of details in the written report, but Bailey's going to walk you through the first three goal areas, and then I'll see the last two. Hi there, I'm Bailey Thaler, fourth grade at Broken Arrow. Um, our first goal area was with the primary support. So the ultimate goal was we were wanting to provide more of that developmentally appropriate learning for our um, K-1 students who are coming in. Um, we noticed they needed maybe some more hands-on and getting them kind of moving. So we just started with just early movements in the morning to get them ready to go um, and the best, uh, their best learning. Um, after that, we started making connections with other schools that model or, modeled this similar um, support with more of a play-based play emphasis on learning. So from there, the next year, we hope to pivot into more of those play-based opportunities, but keep it standard focused and allow our students to kind of have that hands-on fun learning to get them excited about education and prepared as well. So we can maybe target those needs um, for those incoming students that they may have that maybe we haven't been able to identify as quickly in the past. Next slide, please. Um, our second goal area is flexible learning. And um, this one is more um, to provide that personalized multi-age learning opportunities for our students that will hopefully increase achievement for them and engagement. And with this participation, we can utilize resources outside of the classroom as well. Um, we started small with this goal. It's kind of a big one. We are just doing small projects with our fourth and our fifth graders, um, including some hands-on STEM learning in the classroom as, um, with teachers of all grade levels. Um, where we hope to go, um, we are trying to create a shared intervention blocks with our whole building where we can have that multi-age um, crossover for learning, whether if it's to extend or to help facilitate later on. Um, and that time will um, will be multi-age as well. Um, we're also looking at some dedicated time for personalized learning and that choice for students. So they have that ability to take ownership of their learning. Um, and we wanna make sure to give that time to them and have that building wide. So that can also be an opportunity where students are working K through five on different objectives and activities. And with that, we wanna include some of our community partners to help support that learning. Um, one of the last pieces with this group, um, those off weeks where we have parent teacher conferences or holidays and those, it kind of breaks up. Um, we wanna see if we can do something with those weeks and make them more purposeful, um, whether it's with an activity, a choice um, of, of, of a STEM or if it's a club based, but it's giving back that choice and that voice for those students with um, how they learn and what they learn about. Next slide, please. Um, our third goal is with our social, emotion, social and emotional supports. So here we're trying to provide those multiple opportunities for students where they can engage um, in learning that will encourage that self-regulation, that awareness, and that growth socially and emotionally. Um, and we want to do kind of a building-wide look at this. So we started with just our first 15, which was how students were coming in in the mornings. We have some students who come in and maybe they aren't... Um, in the best 
state to start their day and to learn. Um, and so we started to give them different opportunities to start their morning and whether that was with a quiet start or they needed that heavy movement and activity. So um, we're gonna continue with that at, um, first 15 is what we call and really give students that again, choice and get them off to the best you know, foot to start their day. We did start collecting data for that to see if it was effective, you know, check in with their zones and see where they started the day and where they may have ended, or I'm sorry, in the morning and where they would have ended the morning after that first 15. And it did provide some pretty good feedback for us to how to maybe make some tweaks in the fall. Um, and then we also introduced to, um, Eagle's Nest. I know some other buildings are doing similar things to this, um, but once a week or once a month, um, we're meeting with Nests and it's a multi-age group again, where um, they come in and we have social emotional learning that, um, is focused on a goal or an activity of that day or for that month. Um, and we're wanting to increase that next year. So where we're going with that, we're wanting to increase that. So that way those students have that kind of small community coming together more often. And it kind of creates those, um, those, those deeper relationships in theory with having the same kind of group from K through five that you'll continue to work with year after year and kind of build that relationship in the building. Um, we will also invite community members to kind of help and participate in those activities with us too. Um, using that screener data will also be helpful for us coming up with the first 15 and letting and kind of pinpointing those students who maybe we need to be um, finding to help start their day off better that maybe weren't utilizing this resource. We really want to kind of use some of the data we've already been gathering in the past in a more um, pinpointed way here. And then also just kind of like we all mentioned throughout the meeting, um, we need to be preparing our staff for the new needs of our students returning in the fall. We need to make sure we are able to help support um, any of the needs they may have. Um, this has taken a toll on, on, on everyone and understanding what they need and how we can best respond to that for them. Amanda's gonna take it over from here. Next slide, please. Bailey. Um, our fourth goal area is uh, what we're calling a learner focused scheduling. Um, and this subcommittee's ultimate goal is to create a balanced calendar that increases overall student engagement and achievement. And this is, um, I would say, a lofty goal area and takes a lot of brainstorming and thinking outside of the box um, with and using that design thinking that we've been trained in throughout the year. Um, where this team has been this year, um, they've been really doing their research, exploring opportunities that could potentially make learning more fluid. Um, we have heard a lot of ideas this year coming from this group, um, and it's really exciting to see. Um, and that through that process, they've also been gathering and analyzing data for what are the levels of support and levels of comfortability, not only from staff in our building, but also community members and our families. So you will see in the written report that we have um, linked the survey results that we put out. Um, we shared that survey and put that out to our um, Broken Arrow families um, in February, and um, they were able to tell us really just what they knew about different um, types of scheduling um, when we're talking about a year-long calendar um, and their level of comfortability with those changes. And so we actually got quite a bit of overwhelming support, um, and it was nice to see that not only our staff and students are um, willing to, you know, think outside the box, but it sounds like our parent community is as well. Um, so where we are going with that, again, this is a very lofty goal and something that is going to take a lot of time. So this team is really focused on something much in the future. So thinking more about a potential calendar change for the 2021-2022 school year um, and beyond. But right now, we're really focused on utilizing that parent survey um, to create opportunities for more parent involvement um, and pulling those, those parents in and more communities, um, I'm sorry, community organizations like Boys and Girls Club and other things in order to hear different perspectives and to make sure that we are um, hearing everyone's voice in this process. Another thing that this team is working on um, is also brainstorming scheduling solutions that might affect our building even next year um, and looking at how we can incorporate more parent connections um, through that process. And then we are also looking at how we can align with professional development um, across the district. Um, a lot of 
calendar um, decisions are made based off of you know, being cohesive as a, as a district and um, offering ways for us to collaborate with multiple teachers in multiple buildings. And so when you start looking at different calendar options, that obviously comes into play. And so that is something that we are continuing to brainstorm and try to create um, creative solutions for um, that professional alignment and the potential to maybe team with other buildings um, in that effort. Next slide, please. And then our fifth goal area and last goal area that we'll present tonight um, is about our student behavior supports. Um, our ultimate goal in this area is to enhance behavior supports that unite our building and allow students to learn about strategies that they can use to empower themselves to be ready to learn for current and future learning in an ever-changing world. And um, this again, much like our social emotional team, um, the goal areas and the prototypes that we have put in place speak now more importantly, more than ever. Um, but where we've been with this goal is reviewing and brainstorming ways to enhance the consistency and buy-in with current procedures and protocols that we already have in place. Um, our behavior support through CI3T and all of the consistent procedures and protocols that we have there lays such a strong framework for our building, um, but we, through many redesign conversations, um, just realized the need was there to review and brainstorm um, some new ideas in order to enhance the consistency of some of those protocols. So we analyzed the data um, from those conversations and surveys and discussed possible solutions to existing hurdles and also needed supports. And that is also um, outlined in much more detail in the written report. And where we are going with this goal is working to establish consistent and school-wide implementation of those enhanced procedures and protocols, um, which we're excited to facilitate um, starting in the fall if we're able to start in a physical space or we're excited to get uh, creative with how we can uh, accomplish this in a virtual space. Um, we also want to incorporate frequent and consistent opportunities for whole school celebrations and learning together. So right now, um, we offer a lot of ways to celebrate our students um, as a whole building, but this team really wants to focus and shift um, not only celebrating our students, but also doing more whole building learning together about um, expectations, um, but also overall building community and learning. And then we also are looking at a school wide access to a sensory room and also developing a ready to learn process to help focus on some of those self regulation and self awareness strategies. Next slide, please. All right, this is our kind of wrap up slide to let you know um, the overarching goals that we have for the future. So with being future focused, some things that we are going to be working on overall that um, encompass all five goal areas um, are seeking out additional building wide training um, regarding personalized learning, um, play based learning and then social emotional supports. So we are a um, lot of a lot of our teams are really looking and researching for um, different training opportunities. We've also partnered and talked with um, our partners at Greenbush um, about some options for personalized learning training and other things. So we're excited about some of those opportunities. Another goal area for us is strengthening our communication and feedback loops. Um, we are excited to offer parents um, a space on our each of our committees. Uh, we know that there's definite um, interest on the scheduling committee, but we also want to open that up and hear from other parents on each of our committees um, if we can get the involvement. Uh, we are also working on a redesign specific website. Um, Bailey has been working very hard on, on this endeavor and um, we are really working to have accessible opportunities for feedback. So creating that feedback loop that not just parents and students um, and staff, but also our community members um, at Broken Arrow. And then our last overarching goal is that community outreach and partnerships. Um, we have some really neat ways that we're brainstorming, especially utilizing some community partners during our personalized learning blocks in order to not only increase community connections, but also provide students with some real world application skills um, and opportunities. That is all from our Broken Arrow team. Again, our written report has a lot more details, but we would love to answer any questions you may have.
Can I, can I jump in, Melissa? Yes, go ahead. Um, first of all, I, know, I was taking some notes while you were talking, so I apologize if it was interrupting your um, conversation. I just want to say how impressed I am with the work that you've been doing. And um, we, I attended, you might remember, a um, board breakfast, and you all presented. And I was super excited about the direction you were going. And it's really cool to see how it's come um, so together so cohesively. And the vision you had then is really similar to where you guys landed now. So it just really speaks to that um, idea that when you have these teacher-led initiatives, you guys knew where you needed to go all along, and now you just you've got this path to do it. Um, and it, I'm just super excited about your emphasis and all the good things that will come for um, Broken Arrow Kids. So thank you so much for doing this. And hopefully, we get to see other. Um, and I know, actually, Dr. Stubblefield has talked about this a lot, that we get to see this benefit will be available to other schools uh, as we learn from you. So thanks for your efforts. Just amazing. Thank you so much. Thank I, you. Yes, I agree. Um, I, was, I was there also and just had um, an, a wonderful time just hearing and seeing the enthusiasm um, within the teachers. And just I can't imagine how um, excited and engaged the the students were as well, the scholars were as well. So thank you for all the hard work you're doing. Thank you. Thanks. Any more, any questions for Brook and Arrow? This is Carol. And I, and I too, I just want to commend your team on the work that you're doing and hear the excitement in your voice. I'm actually, I, 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 do, I, get excited. I, I commend you on the lofty, the lofty goal. I know that Amanda was talking about you know, a lot of that's good that's what we want so thank you thank you for that encouragement i appreciate it thanks again thank you yeah no Chris, maybe i'm going in between screens so i apologize i think deerfield should be next deerfield okay thank you yep well we ready for Deerfield then? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for allowing us this opportunity to share with you um, what we've been doing with redesign. I'm Joni Appleman. I'm the principal at Deerfield. And presenting with me today are our pilot and learning coach, Caitlin Feeney, our second grade teacher, Anna Les Lansbury, and then uh, Madeline Herrera, our third grade teacher. So um, much of our research and trials were happening and getting ready to happen when school was shut down. So we're very thankful that we have um, the fall to continue to explore our redesign efforts that were already in process and also to explore some ideas that have emerged from what we've learned from and through our school shutdown. So you can go to the next slide. So, um, of course, our process um, started with developing our why statement. So why it was important um, to our students, families and staff to redesign education at Deerfield. So after gathering some feedback from our stakeholders, we quickly realized there were a few patterns that emerged. Um, the need for essential skills, not only academic skills, but also those soft skills, um, having a healthy and emotional well-being, having more movement, not only for our students, but for our staff as well, and getting back to some of those basics and fundamentals. Um, so to our core team, this sounded much like um, a very familiar book called All I Really Needed to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten. Um, and from there, um, our why was created. So um, everything I needed, everything I needed today, I found at Deerfield. We felt that this why statement would encompass the unmet needs of our students, staff, and our parents. Next slide. And then our vision is really about taking all of that feedback and creating a school community that focuses on and values the whole person and empowers them to reach their potential using different and creative avenues. Our vision mentions students, but we also talk a lot about the, having these same needs um, for, our, um, for our staff as well, um, for them to also reach their full potential. So you'll hear a little bit more about staff um, throughout the presentation. Next slide, I believe, is Caitlin. Yes, thank you. On this slide, you can see our top 10 ideas for redesign. This list has been narrowed down many, many times because staff generated such incredible ideas. 
We ar arrived at these final ideas by surveying parents, staff, and students. While we know we can't do all of these things, this was our list prior to spring break. After spring break, we were going to dive deeper into each of these categories to gather data and try various small bets. Planning for next year, we will need to take additional data and try some things out to prepare for the launch in January. Next slide, please. So the sustainability piece started in my classroom as a mentoring program through the U.S. Green Building Council. As it developed, it became apparent it fits perfectly with redesign. So the plan spans three academic years. It has very simple ideas as well as more complex. Um, and it was created with lots of different stakeholders at the table. We want students to be at the center of this entire plan and so we want them helping implementing each step as much as possible. Um, our most complex and ambitious idea within sustainability is our outdoor classroom and outdoor education program that we would like to implement at Deerfield. So um, Gould Evans caught wind of this idea and they wanted to work with the third, my third grade class on designing an outdoor classroom. And so that started in February and we've been lucky enough to continue through virtual learning. So I'm co-teaching with Gould Evans three times a week in order to meet uh, the initial timeline that we had when we first started this plan. Um, and then we're also working with an outdoor educator who helped create curriculum in Washington State for their school systems. And now she's helping us create lessons for kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, pie in the sky, dream world, we would like to hire um, an outdoor educator and then have that work as a, ro a special rotation. Um, we know that in order to get that um, accomplished and have longevity for this program, we need really good research. And so we've been lucky enough that Jasmine Moore, who is our sustainability director for Douglas County, has graciously offered to help with setting up research uh, with a doctoral or graduate student from KU. Um, so currently, uh, we're seeking funding through various local foundations and, um, you know, this being the sustainability plan, we want sustainable funding as well. And so we think that data is really going to help um, pave the way for that. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, another area that we've been looking into is personalized learning and there's dozens of definitions out there. So the first thing we had to do was um, come up with uh, one single definition, and we went with the state of Kansas's definition. And uh, since it's taking a look at the whole student, that includes cognitive, interpersonal, and intrapersonal skills. And um, so you're going to see us touching on all of those skills uh, throughout the presentation. Next slide, please. We also took a look at revamping our response to intervention in our PLC time. We already know that um, both of those have incredible uh, effect sizes. And so just looking at how we could um, fine tune those. And so we've been looking at how can we create a more collaborative system with our PLCs and our RTI and um, use consistent um, data as we create flexible RTI groups. Next slide. Okay. Um, the restructuring team started with several big ideas. We wanted to find ways we could maximize student learning, reach students at their individual levels, bolster students' social emotional needs, incorporate clubs and community, community outreach, and allow teachers more time to plan for their new RTI groups we are hoping to start. After lots of twists and turns, we now realize that we would not be able to create a schedule for next year until we finalize the other team's plans. Continuous learning has also given us new ideas that we would like to look into that might help us in structuring. Next slide. The play-based kindergarten team was created to look at developmentally appropriate practices for our youngest elementary learners. The team began looking into free play versus guided or structured play. They felt that while play is essential to learning in kindergarten, a structured play format might best fit our school's learning community. 
In this scenario, play is still child-centered, however. The teacher interacts with students during this time to provide demonstration or scaffolding of higher thinking. With the start of the kindergarten year, we would pro provide students with a variety of activities that include open-ended choices, but the majority of their time given to explore, investigate, and extend concepts through hands-on experiences. The beginning of their year would also include several short, less than 30 minutes, whole group lessons to help build upon the classroom environment and relationships. As the kindergarten year progresses, so would the schedule. The whole group instruction time would increase as well as the small group teacher directed instruction. We have some staff turnover in kindergarten, but we hope to start play-based kindergarten in the fall. Next slide, please. Members of the movement team have been looking at the benefits and impacts of adding in more movement and mindfulness throughout the year or throughout the day. Before spring break, three staff members began taking baseline data on the amount of off-task behaviors that were seen at certain times of the day. After baseline data collection, one teacher will add in five minutes of mindfulness time. One teacher will add in 10 minutes of outdoor time, such as walks, learning outside, reading, and structured play. And one teacher will add in 10 minutes of extra recess or free play. These movement and mindfulness times will all be added in five or 10 minutes just prior to the span of time looked at during the baseline data collection. The pl plan was to implement this after spring break. Due to COVID-19, we are unable to do so. Once we return to school, we will have a different group of students, so baseline data will have to be taken again. Another team member has been researching gross motor rooms and the effect that Having time dedicated to focusing on gross motor skills has on off-task behaviors in the classroom. These components will all be a continued focus once school resumes. Next slide, please. So one of our goals for KISA was to get student input via surveys at least twice a year. One of our questions was, do you feel like you have one adult in the building that you can trust to and talk to about anything? We had 150 students respond yes and 34 who responded no. From there, our team started to research ways to build connections with students. One way was to implement clubs and its impact on social skills. Two of our staff members went to Hillcrest to observe how they did clubs and were very impressed. Students were very engaged and many were even running down the halls because they were so excited to get to their club. The enthusiasm was absolutely contagious. The current plan is to roll out clubs to fourth and fifth graders based on their interests. We know that community support will be integral in the success of these clubs and hope next year will be a successful start to clubs that could eventually and hopefully trickle down all the way from kindergarten to fifth grade. Next slide. Joni, I think you're on mute. <laughs> and that concludes my speech. <laughs> okay, I'll start over. Um, so this team is looking at our proactive and reactive plans for discipline. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so we're exploring ways to increase student engagement and intrinsic motivation toward learning while also de decreasing repeated, repeated and disruptive behaviors that interfere with whole class, the whole, the whole learning environment. Our ultimate goal is keeping all of our students in class regulated and ready to learn. Um, some of the things that we're currently researching are restorative justice, conscious discipline, and what works with intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Um, in the fall, we um, hope to continue our research, including possible possibly visiting some different sites and collaborating with schools that are using these approaches. Um, we will also want to, once we figure out what it is that we feel like will work with our students, we want to explore ways, um, or different ways for staff professional development um, for our school community. Next slide. Um, cl a smaller class size, uh, it was evident from the feedback that we received from our, from our community that they valued um, smaller class sizes. So this committee was charged with researching the effects of class size and how to accomplish this without additional funding. So 
So not surprising, um, the committee found that simply lowering class size did not make a significant impact on student achievement. However, what did make a difference was using data to create smaller groups for more focused and personalized instruction. Also not surprising was that teaching students in smaller groups fostered more personal relationships with students, increased student engagement, and, and improved overall classroom cli climate. And all of these things also had that, a positive impact on teacher morale. So this team um, also talked about creative ways to lower class sizes by teaching in smaller groups, which then led into the work that some of our other committees were already charged with, like our RTI and clubs. So this team is going to emerge to support the efforts of those other committees as they continue um, in their redesign efforts. Next slide. And now you're on mute, Caitlin. I just get so excited talking about this stuff. I literally forget what I'm doing. I'm so sorry. OK, <laughs> what if all staff felt valued and supported while at Deerfield? This was the opening question that was stated to this group. How could we ensure staff felt welcomed and supported within the walls of Deerfield? What are some barriers that we would have to break down in order to build staff morale? How can we involve our incredible classified staff more? What about the balance between school and home that is so incredibly elusive and hard to manage? From our time together and the small bets we tried this year, we plan to reconvene once we get back into the building to find days throughout next year that we can give some extra support and encouragement to our valued staff. Maybe thank you letters could be placed in staff mailboxes. Perhaps we have a yoga teacher come out after school so we can exercise together. What if PTO offered a variety of snacks and cool beverages on a hot day for collaboration? It might not be much, but our hope is that when staff leave after the workday, they feel loved, valued, and excited to come back to work the next day. Next slide, please. In conclusion, when you visit Deerfield Elementary next year, we hope you can see the listed items. We appreciate your continued support of us as we continue to dream big for the future of our students and community. We hope that you can see just how strongly we feel about making a positive change at Deerfield. With that, I'll leave you with the reminder of our why. Everything our scholars needed today, they can find at Deerfield. Everything our educators needed today, they can find at Deerfield. Everything our community needed today, it can be found at Deerfield. Everything I needed today, I found at Deerfield. Thank you so much. We can have questions now. Yes, thank you. Questions? Bye. I'll jump in. Does somebody else have, want to jump in as a board member for me? Okay, I, so I was super excited about the last one. I'm so excited about this thing at Deerfield. You guys, every time I go in there, I'm always excited because you have this kind of cool vibe in your um, building where it just feels like you all like each other. I don't know if that's true. But it kind of comes that way. Um, but the, okay. I, as somebody that um, started my career in social work within a school working with kids that had that we identified as having behavioral issues it's really cool that you have keyed in on so many things that are going to allow you to expand both the work and competencies and understanding um, your curriculum and expanding uh, the, the knowledge and content but all the while the things that you have done um, allow students access to those things that help with self-regulation like access to the outdoors like social engagement a movement and this emphasis on um, sustainability and mindfulness and a couple other things I picked up in your um, presentation, you're extending to your staff, which awesome. Like that's that just makes everything that much more exciting about coming to work and getting to work with the cool kids that you have at Deerfield. So um, it's really neat to see from like 1990 something to today that there's this cohesive plan to bring these moving parts together and, and create an environment you're all excited to come to and it's really going to benefit kids. So um, I'm not surprised to see it from Deerfield, but it's really exciting. So I could talk about it all day too. So maybe Caitlin and I will um, <laughs> hang out after the meeting or something. Thanks for your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I, board members. Yeah, this is Paula Smith. Um, I'm excited to see will do so much because I attended Deerfield when I moved um, from Chirval School to um, Deerfield Elementary. So it's great. It's awesome. I look forward to coming back and visiting sometime. 
this is Carol, and I, you know, I'm excited that you included mindfulness in your plan because I, I actually taught mindfulness at the Veterans Administration in San Kansas Secretary, so I would like to come and see that in practice sometime. So if you would invite me, I would be there in a hurry. Thank you. Yes, again, thank you so much for all your hard work, citing times for, for education. Any thank more que questions? Okay, great. Um, now I wrote this down. Next we have um, Free State. Yes. We're, we're ready. <laughs> Did you have mute? <laughs> yeah, good evening. Um, my name is Myron Graber. I'm the principal at Free State. Uh, we have three co-pilots that work that lead our redesign effort, uh, Michelle Salmons, Amy Landwehr, and Steve Heffernan. Michelle and Amy are with us tonight and will give you the full report. We, being a large high school, or actually the largest high school, largest school in the state to go into redesign has been somewhat of a challenge, but we really have focused on our why as as being success or post-secondary success, success for all students. We have three goal areas that were identified through our data process, gathering process, those being balanced for both staff and students, uh, that meaning somewhat in, schedule, in scheduling, flexibility, uh, wellness and mental health. Our second goal had to deal with relevance, with the, a relevant curriculum, an up-to-date curriculum, uh, engaging community, and our last goal had to do with habits of success. We had just started into a small bet when COVID-19 hit, but COVID-19 might have been the best pilot program we could have ever had because it has allowed us to identify uh, some of the ideas that we had been talking about throughout the process. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle and Amy, and they will give you the rest of the update. Thank you, Myron. I'm Amy Landwehr, and I'm a social studies teacher at Free State. And um, as Myron just said, um, a lot of the ideas uh, surrounding our why statements grew out of this idea of post-secondary success. And that really goes back to um, taking a look at um, conversations that we've been having as a staff for a very long time. Our school improvement plan has focused on um, making our school uh, a place that fosters learning for all students, uh, that fosters lifelong learning. And then when we look at our KISA goals, we really have uh, honed in on looking at this post-secondary success rate. And, um, you know, high school graduation rates only, only show a tiny bit of the picture. And what we really want to see happen is all of our students that leave Free State, we want to make sure that they are our positioned to be able to integrate into the community and become um, happy, well-adjusted, um, emotionally and socially healthy individuals who can contribute in a meaningful way. And so looking at this, um, this is really where we started with our why statements. And the really good thing about working with adolescents is, is that they ask why about everything all the time. So um, we're all pretty accustomed to having to answer those questions in some way, shape or form. So. We have kind of a built-in uh, thinking about this at the high school level. And um, if we could go to the next slide here, please. Thank you. So our, our why statement is really bound up in the goal areas that we identified in the redesign process. And again, uh, these are things that we, we spend a lot of time taking a look at. And this, um, in terms of like engaging all of our stakeholders, this has been built into the process sort of at every, every step. We started off the beginning of the 2019-2020 school year as a staff working with Think Wrong. And that staff blitz really got us thinking uh, in, you know, in terms of um, universal design or design thinking where we wanted to go with our redesign process. And it laid, uh, a, it created a template rather for us to use with staff, or I'm sorry, rather students and then also parents so that we were engaging all of our stakeholders. And through that process of um, brainstorming and trying to imagine what school could look like um, after redesign, we came up with a lot of uh, repetitive um, 
areas for improvement. Staff and students and parents were identifying things like needing balance in um, workload and stress load and needing to continue to build relationships. Students um, and staff also identified flexibility. Um, everyone, all, all of our stakeholders identified wanting um, the education of our students to be relevant so that, again, we can sort of target that post-secondary success rate uh, that our students are leaving Free State equipped to become productive members of the community. Um, and part of that, it, it leads right into um, making sure that everything that's happening in Free State is very applicable and real world. And that's, that's a term that um, my students have heard me say many, many times. I don't like this distinction between real world and high school because high school is their real world. Uh, but, you know, we're really looking at post high school outside of our building. What is it that they're going to be able to take from us to then apply to other settings? Um, and so, again, those three goal areas, balance, relevance, and then habits of success, um, became the driving force between, behind our redesign process. And in doing this, um, in those, those um, think wrong blitzes that were held with staff, students, and parents, not only was it a process of identifying why we wanted to redesign, but we were also um, inherent in that process. We're looking at, well, what might it look like and how white might we be able to get there? Um, and so it was really hitting on uh, looking at this kind of a cohesive uh, process altogether. And we saw some themes emerge. Um, here you see on the student um, blitz and the student input committee, things like time, grades, relationship schedules, and then on our parent and community blitz, um, family support for mental health and uh, social emotional wellness, and again, um, community integration. Go to the next slide, please. And so here just articulated a little bit more um, this process, again, as, as Myron just um, stated, you know, a school of 1,800 students and over 130 staff and all the parents that go along with that, we were oftentimes overwhelmed with the amount of responses that we had, the, the number of ideas, and so it was this redesign process has really been one of refining over and over and over again, and we have in that process identified some of the um, most often repeated ideas or themes or needs, and they are, they are here under our goal areas. You can skip to the next slide. And so again, um, here looking at, so all right, if our, our why and our goal areas are wanting to achieve more balance for students and staff, wanting to ensure that Everything that happens in our school building is going to be relevant to students when they leave Free State and fostering uh, the whole student developmentally, helping them develop habits of success so that they are able to, um, again, function independently once they leave our doors. Uh, we had to start asking these what if questions. So what would it look like then? And we started hitting on, uh, again, there were themes that, that popped up and you can see these questions here. What if learning happens outside the classroom? And uh, what if scheduling were such that there would be um, more or a reduction of, of stress and workload? Because that was one of the, the biggest themes that emerged from staff and students uh, was a, an overwhelming workload. Um, and that takes away from the relationship building that happens within our uh, building. And every, every adult in Free State's building can attest to the fact that Social and emotional concerns um, ha are, have been increasing every single year for some time now. And so working on building those relationships to address social and emotional learning was a, a key part of what we wanted to achieve in redesign. Um, and then again, turning to um, making learning more relevant, project-based learning and practical skills are a vital part of what we were envisioning here. And you can see some of the, um, comments that students and teachers identified under each one of these areas. So under balance, uh, students were identifying more time for schoolwork, more time to get help. Teachers were looking at more time to provide intervention, more time to build relationships. We can see under relevance, um, looking at exploring, again, more um, 
practical hands-on project-based curriculum that students would be able to apply in a work or a community engagement setting. Uh, teachers were really looking at building relationships with community members so that what happens inside the school is not radically different than what's happening outside the school. And then on habits of success, our students are frequently reporting that they need uh, guidance in terms of how to actually be those productive community members. A lot of times, even our, our highest achieving students are, who are very, very capable in an academic theater when they are uh, faced with working in a work environment or working with other people and building teams or things like that. Some of those, what we would normally call soft skills, have not really been fostered during school because so much emphasis has been on academic development. Um, and we see sort of that same type of feedback from, from teachers here. Next slide. Michelle, do you want to jump in here? switch over. All right, so um, you saw a lot of those ideas. Um, our staff and students, you know, had no lack of, of suggestions. Um, so one of the one of the processes we went through as a redesign team at one of um, our trainings, um, I believe this was the last one that Think Wrong was like pretty heavily involved in, was um, graphing out um, all of these strategies that we were thinking of that would help us um, reach our goals and finding those those more innovative solutions. And where does innovation happen? That's happening when our challenges are pretty uncertain. Um, we're not quite sure what we're going to see ahead of us. And those solutions are unknown. And that gears us towards, that helped us lead towards where do we really need to focus on? Because again, Everything, I don't think there was a time where we never felt um, underwhelmed by this process in terms of how many staff and students and then how many ideas and all of the needs that people were expressing that they needed. So let's go to the next slide. Because you'll see a little of those, um, you'll see more of those over on the left. Um, we did when looking at those really, the ones that kind of fell in that think wrong area, where we um, are looking at awarding student credit, we're looking at the schedule, um, those were our big, big themes. Everything kind of came back towards most of the things we wanted to do. Well, we're, there's no way we're gonna be able to do that with the schedule that we're in. Um, if we're wanting to build relationships, if we're wanting to have a schedule that really fosters relationship building, um, the schedule we have just doesn't doesn't um, do it for us. If we're wanting to have partnerships with our communities and we want students to go and work with other businesses and have that opportunity to come in, we don't necessarily have a schedule for that. If we want our teachers to collaborate with one another cross-curricularly and be able to see where the ties are horizontally throughout our curriculums, we don't have the time necessarily for our staff to meet outside of their departments. So, so that's why schedule, um, we, we get caught up in a lot when we think, well, what are, where are we gonna go to? So much of it is, as well, if, if we don't figure out another way of scheduling our classes, of going about our day from start to finish, we, we're not quite sure how we're gonna do some of these other things. And um, beyond that, and it ties in with schedule, it's just how we're awarding credit. Um, are we we look a lot at standard-based learning, so um, having students have more choice and more voice in how they're completing assignments, having teachers have more voice and choice on how they can have students complete those assignments, not based on points, but based on those priority standards and knowing are students meeting those standards or are they not. Um, and that could even get us into going beyond grade levels and things like that. So um, we'll, we'll be still talking about standard-based learning um, as we go forward. Um, this, if you look, we don't have our attachment for our, um, our report, but in our report is our gap analysis um, where we came up, with, where we knew where our present state was in terms of awarding credit and schedule and then where some of those barriers were. And so looking forward, um, if you can go to the next slide, 
I will, we'll talk about here. This was where we were planning on, this was where we were planning on basically prototyping a bunch of strategies in one. And this was going to happen in the month of April. So we called it Free State Flex Time. This was going to one, give us a little bit of idea of how we might um, uh, allow more flexibility in scheduling. So students were going to be able to choose what sessions they wanted to go to. Teachers were giving, were able to um, provide sessions they wanted to give that may even be outside of their um, teaching area or maybe having speakers come in. Um, we were looking at having businesses come in and all these students were gonna be able to choose where they were, where they were going to go based on that. Um, a lot of it was directed towards um, figuring out individual plans of study, working on social emotional learning. So in just a moment, you'll see kind of, um, I'll give some examples of where we were, um, how that was being met through there. Um, and then ultimately the biggest thing that we loved about this was it was it would provide an opportunity for our students and our staff to build relationships with one another. Um, we know that there's gonna be students who will choose sessions uh, with other staff, with staff members that they like, and that builds a relationship there. But then they also have this opportunity to go and meet a new teacher that they may have never met otherwise. So um, another opportunity for them just to build relationships with each other. Uh, we're going to be looking at how we might go about, again, doing something like this. Um, let me see. Let's go to this next slide real quick, and then I'm going to give Amy a chance to chime in to see if I've missed um, a little bit. But here was, a, we had all of our staff fill out a series of forms for these nine different days that we were going to provide. And this was just for one of the days um, and where these categories laid that the, these were what teachers were offering to students that, um, that they believed we didn't want to create anything extra for teachers to put even more on their load. This is kind of a way for teachers almost to more fuel their fire than to put it out. Um, if you're really into, you know, I, I love my meditation and my mindfulness every day. So I believe I had Monday mindfulness. Um, that's going to help me get throughout my day or walking outside on the track. So health and wellness was a big one. Um, and then the other big one you can see is the tutoring or open lab. Um, we talk a lot about flex mod. Um, if you know about the flex module schedule, the flex mod schedule, and one of the beauty about flex mod is it provides chances in your your week for students to go and get help from teachers and smaller groups um, by creating more flexibility. Um, so this just kind of shows teachers are wanting to this. We're not really able to see what students were wanting to choose from it. And that was um, some data we still really want to collect. Um, and then the other is just that extra study hall, just time to work, um, more time. It's always something that we always all want is a little bit more time. There's other things. Um, we had automotive classes. We had a lot of different things that would lend to students being able to identify possibilities possible career choices. I mean, this was just like I say, it is a, um, a, a prototype of a ton of small bets within. Um, so now we're kind of thinking, how might we do this in the future? Um, just before I switch back over to um, Amy for this next slide, we did um, some of the schools that we were going and visiting or planning to visit, because that had also been affected. We did go to see Baser Linwood to go and explore their Innovation Academy. Um, again, looking at that was really part of our relevance. We had a lot of people on our relevance committee go to this um, tour because we want to figure out that big what if, what if learning happened outside of the classroom? Um, and so learning, looking at how students can almost design their own learning just like we're designing for them you know making them players in their own education we were planning let's see myron and steve were about to go to south carolina myron's unmuting 
Correct. South Carolina, yes. South the Carolina. The River Bluff, right? River Bluff yes. High School, looking again at the FlexMod schedule um, of ways of taking a lot of students and organizing so they might be in lectures some days, they, um, a certain amount of weeks, they might be in small groups. Um, they have more flexibility of having time between their classes. It's just something we'll explore. We were also planning to visit Omaha High School, who's been doing a FlexMod schedule since the 70s. Um, and then finally, there was one more school we were planning on visiting here in Kansas that runs seven student-led businesses within their school. So we're really interested in how, again, we can make learning more applicable for our students and give them those, those again, the cliches, that real world. But um, we've already noticed through some of the classes we have when students are making work that, um, that the public gets to see, they take ownership over that learning. So those are just some of those things we wanna pull in um, and, and give our students opportunities for. Amy, do you wanna catch up here on anything I may have missed and then wrap us up with a little school closure in our next steps? Yeah, so just uh, to add to what Michelle was just saying, um, this one idea, Free State Flex Time, it was really designed to um, try and hit as many different ideas as possible. And one of the, one of the um, components that's made this somewhat difficult, uh, a difficult process is because what we're really trying to do is create a system that's going to provide for maximum flexibility for all of our students to have a uh, choice in how they spend their time while also maintaining really rigorous standards and building relationships. And sometimes those um, are, are difficult to imagine together. And with Free State Flex Time, what was going to be a primary component of that was that students would be able to self-select into some of the areas that they were prioritizing as their goal areas. So for some students, um, out of the three goal areas that we've identified for redesign, um, balance, relevance, and habits of success, for some students, relevance was their number one goal area. And so in this pilot program that we had designed, they would be able to self-select into more practical or hands-on type of choice sessions where they could explore that. If balance was an area that was individually more important to a student, they could select the tutoring or open lab or study hall session to try and fit in some balance within their day. If social and emotional wellness, which is part of that balance um, goal, they could select one of the wellness uh, sessions. So again, trying to create maximum flexibility was um, what we were thinking of with this flex time. So while it's called, it has one name, it's really, a wide variety of opportunities for students. And if we could go to the next slide. Um, moving forward from here, so in our in our free state flex time, what what was the plan? And again, it, it got cut short um, midstream, but uh, we had investigation teams that were forming up that were going to be then collecting data and analyzing the results from the flex time sessions. We had planned on um, surveying students and staff and parents, again, our stakeholders after the process. And we were going to be examining uh, the sessions that were more aligned with looking at competency-based models. So these could have been sessions that maybe um, students were designing some independent study um, projects to conduct during flex time sessions, or maybe there was a cross-curricular session offered, let's say, for example, a U.S. history session with language arts. Maybe there was a deep dive into um, one particular topic and then assessing what was actually achieved in that um, to see how that competency-based model or, or curriculum would work in um, looking at something broader for redesign moving forward. And again, this goes back to uh, as the district, you know, having prioritized our priority standards, seeing where they overlap, or we can uh, reach multiple of those from different disciplines in a, in like one particular unit of instruction. We also had a team that would be looking at uh, individual plans of study 
And uh, this is really looking at some of those sessions were uh, designed to provide students with the opportunity to uh, investigate what um, career pathways might exist that they had not necessarily had an opportunity to explore in their regular classes that they have to take. So looking at um, what we may have learned from this process in regards to individual plans of study, uh, we were also going to be assessing what we learned from just having flexible time within a day. How did students use that time? One of the key pieces of data there that we were going to be looking for was attendance. If students were given the opportunity to have some flexible time during their day, what did they do with it? Um, that was going to tell us a lot about the viability of that kind of scheduling change in, in the future. We were also going to be looking at um, the impact that the Free State Flex Time Schedule had on community partnerships. How much community engagement were we actually able to facilitate? How many community members came in and worked with students? How many students were able to go out and do maybe some type of service, service project within the community during this time? We also were going to assess social and emotional learning. There were a lot of sessions that were uh, designed around wellness. And so surveying student outcomes from those sessions, and then again, looking at scheduling. So how did that open time during the day um, really impact um, some of those questions related to balance? So those are the investigation teams that had been planned for Free State Flex Time. Obviously that has not happened. We're now in school closure. And so what we have tried to do, as Myron said at the beginning of our um, presentation here, the school closure, continuous learning has really in some ways, um, you know, forced us to jump very, very quickly into some components of what we were going to test with free state flex time. So we obviously have a lot of flexibility of schedule now. Um, there is... Um, not quite the same type of uh, focus on uh, maybe competency-based model of curriculum currently, just because that is not necessarily a priority item right now, but it is something that we are actually assessing. Um, we have designed a series of surveys that have gone to students, staff, and parents. And one of these pieces that we are examining is how much uh, assessment of student learning during this time was being done on uh, a, a points-based model, which is a more traditional model um, within a class, within the standard Carnegie unit of instruction, and how much of it, how much of that assessment was being done based on competencies. And so that's um, one of the things that we're looking at learning from the school closure. And then that's obviously one of the big pieces that we'll be looking at, how can we still go ahead and test that more robustly next uh, school year when we come back from the closure. Um, we've also looked at um, some of our staff have been bringing in members of the community to do some Zoom sessions with students. Um, Lori Folsom, one of our um, journalism teachers, has been facilitating some sessions um, where community members have been and, and professionals have been hosting some practical sessions for students, giving some career advice, career advice or um, illustrating some potential career pathways. And then uh, we, we are, you know, assessing some social and emotional components of this just by um, gauging how our students fared when there were some changes to their schedule and their flexibility. And obviously there's uh, a whole layer of um, other type of stress here that would not normally have existed, but that's something that we're still trying to sort of take the pulse of. And then uh, again, scheduling. So we're trying to, uh, in these surveys from continuous learning, still see what we can learn from the school closure and then have that inform sort of an updated prototype when we come back from the fall. Obviously our prototype is probably going to look a little bit different because we're learning a lot right now, um, but it will likely be some, something that's very similar to free state flex time based on, uh, you know, with some changes made best based on what we've learned now. Um, and then obviously on the new prototype, we will, we will create the new scoreboards so that we can continually provide feedback to our stakeholders on how that prototype is going. Um, and those will be, you know, we've, we've talked about a variety of ways for those to happen. Uh, primarily it'll be, uh, you know, something very, very public within our school building so students and staff can see that immediately, but obviously 
um, a way to report back out to parents and community members as well. We have a we have a website that's already been in use for the school year, so that will remain an important component of how we deliver um, what we've learned. Questions are there for us? And question board members. Thank you for that, for your hard work. I remember when um, sitting with Michelle and, and they were talking about um, the redesign and just the excitement that you all had and um, hope that we can, you can get out there and try it out in the near future. We do too. Board members, if you don't have any questions, then we'll um, hear from Hillcrest. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Tammy Becker, the principal at Hillcrest. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Joe. Um, my job tonight is to just give an overview um, of our process. And our um, journey with redesign actually started in March of 2018. Um, I took the four teachers who are presenting tonight to the Kansans Can Symposium. And really our purpose when we went was to further our work around our KISA goals. And after day two of that conference, um, they, they approached me about taking the idea of redesign back to our staff, staff because they felt like staff and students were already engaged in many of the initiatives that were shared by the first seven uh, Mercury schools. Um, so we shared our interest um, with um, district admin and th late that March, um, we were able to do the redesign vote um, and that was held between Hillcrest or held at Hillcrest and several of our um, district secondary schools. Um, Hillcrest had an 80% approval rating, um, but at that point we didn't have a secondary partner and um, that was required at the time. So um, if you know our innovative staff, they were disappointed about not getting a partner, but they were eager to move forward. So we approached um, district admin about doing some work informally um, and these four teachers agreed to lead the charge. <clears throat> so um, over the, about the last year and a half, we have implemented um, informally, I would say, um, morning meetings at all levels. We created our school families. We created a st staff self-care room. We fully implemented, excuse me, we fully implemented our Wednesday clubs. Um, we added additional recess time. We used purposeful PLCs to write and implement um, PBLs at each grade level. We increased our family engagement um, through some at-home resources. Um, and probably more, mo probably the most important was we better, we better uh, facilitated the use of um, and the skills of our ESL and, and uh, title teachers through some um, co-teaching. So last March, um, after we had a 90% vote of support, um, we evaluated what we had implemented and we started to make plans um, for this year. And during that first semester, uh, we spent lots of our beginning of the year staff meeting time working collaboratively to narrow our why um, and to develop our vision statement. And some of the key words that came out of our um, why activities, was just to um, engage, we want to engage our students, we want to empower our students, um, we want to provide them with um, lots of opportunities for extensions and enrichment. So we came up with um, just the statement, engage, um, enrich, empower every, every student or every scholar each day. Um, and then from there we um, wrote our why our uh, vision, vision statement, which you can see there on the screen. Um, in November and December, we engaged our staff in the what if activities. 
Um, and I felt really good. We had um, we had good parent participation at the district's parent blitz. blitz. Um, but we also had two working meetings uh, with our diverse school site council. And so they had um, a lot of say in um, our um, investigation teams. Um, so we built consensus around eight focus areas, which teachers will talk about tonight. Um, and in February, we um, surveyed our parents during uh, conferences about the many ideas that we had for small bets um, that our investigation teams were wanting to roll out. Um, and we received feedback from 165 families, uh, which guided many of our action steps um, that you will see in our plan. Um, and I just want to take a minute to share that um, I don't I, I don't know if you got a, the abbreviated version of our playbook, um, but our redesign playbook is long, um, but it is a comprehensive guide that I believe demonstrates the commitment and passion of the staff um, at Hillcrest around redesign. Um, I also feel really good that it will serve as a guide for Sarah and the five new teachers who will join our school community. Um, as a retiring principal, I have a lot of confidence in our teacher leaders um, at Hillcrest that they will continue to work, continue the work that's being shared this evening. Um, and like many shared, while at times the process and the work has been challenging with lots of moving pieces and parts, um, I think the plan is a true reflection of what Hillcrest staff want for every uh, student who walks through the door each day. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nancy and Joe, if you would um, move to the next slide. Hi, I'm Nancy Julo. I'm an instructional coach at Hillcrest and one of the co-pilots, pilot co-pilots, <laughs> there's a lot of us. <laughs> um, I want to share a little bit about our um, redesign focus and work that's always been um, centered around meeting the needs and providing opportunity for each and every unique learner at Hillcrest. Um, the State Department talked a lot about how Kansans believe that you need to change the system, the outdated system for each student to find um, success in redesigning education. And that's what um, our belief is as well. That's why we've um, considered at the top, you'll see uh, systems and structures. And that's our overarching um, area that that is um, implemented in every one of our um, investigation areas. Um, the chart illustrates that each area is also um, intentionally connected with the four pillars um, of redesign, Kansas redesign, as well as the strategic plan across the bottom. You'll see how each one of our investigation areas are connected to um, the strategic plan as well. So, for instance, if you see um, SEL, Ride the Momentum, is, um, falls under the student success skill pillar for uh, state redesign. But it also is um, connected to the work that's being done um, through, the, through the strategic plan, uh, safe and supportive schools. Um, our, just like our structures and systems, they're considered um, kind of an overarching. Our purposeful professional development is also the support um, supported throughout each one of our areas as well. So um, it kind of went back on the other on the other slide as well. But there's uh, we have eight investigation areas um, that uh, that our entire staff is is um, committed to and working through can, and then we can we can go ahead and talk about those uh, the next so four of them are on the next slide sorry <laughs> There we go. I mean, I'm up first. My name is Christine Caffey, and I'm going to talk to you guys about the structures and systems part. So what we realize is that we have a ton of really great educators at Hillcrest, and that includes our ESL staff and our title staff. But a lot of times those services were occurring over on the side. So we're moving to a true co-teaching model that is also multi-age. So just today we voted on our community names and what we're going to call each of our pods. But um, teachers are going to be working together. So that means there's going to be a SPED staff and a gen ed staff working together to create what's best for students. But we also know that when you're co-teaching, you really do need time to plan in order for it to be effective. So part of the structures and systems has to do with relooking um, through the special schedule in order to create time for those teams to come together. 
as well as finding time for the entire community. So like two, three coming together to discuss where we are and where we're going next. So making sure that our PLC process is very purposeful. I'm gonna pass it off to Jessica Larson. Hey, hi, good evening. Um, so I will talk about um, purposeful play and I'll just kind of give you a, like a zoomed out picture for a minute, if you will, and say that the, the goal of this one um, is really that it, um, our very primary kindergarten and first grade areas that those students have um, experiences that are developmentally appropriate and academically appropriate. And so our first proposed action was looking at play-based um, instruction for both kindergarten and first grade. And we've been in contact with um, a school in Olathe that's um, done a lot of work in this area. And what they had done and what we're working on um, at this point is having come kind of like a tapered schedule throughout the year so that the very beginning of the year kindergartners have a lot of that um, purposeful um, uh, developmental play in a lot of different stations and centers working on fine motor skills, gross motor skills, social skills, all of those types of things. Um, and that as the year progresses, that time is decreased, but it's still there. And that in first grade, um, they would have some pockets of time. So just making sure that um, the learning um, happens in a lot of different ways. Um, with that, we also were looking at the age and the needs of our students and our, um, our demographics and our population and really um, realizing that it would be amazing to have an on-site preschool for our families. Um, really not as that, um, you know, accelerated kindergarten boot camp, but really to make sure that those littles that are going to come to us um, in the next year for kindergarten are really ready to go for kindergarten, both socially, emotionally, and academically. Um, so that's down at proposed action C. We're, we um, would love to see that happen, and we're just in talks at this point with um, district staff. But those two, um, that's where those two kind of came. And then um, redesign has really been um, like an organic process. And so when we started talking about play base at primary, um, as we had the feedback loop with the rest of the staff, there were, of course, intermediate and upper grade levels that were wanting to look at what play might look like at those ages, too. So um, those are some things that we're working on that it will look different um, in those areas. Second and third grade, um, just before spring break, we're adding a third recess. And it wasn't, um, it was about 10 minutes, but it was really a structured time where teachers were showing them how you play or square or, you know, those types of things. Um, so really just um, not just having it be a free for all, but really a time to to learn together. Um, and so with that, our next one is the community hub. Hi, my name is Tyler Gill. I'm a third grade teacher at Hillcrest and I really enjoyed that uh, third recess that Jess Jessica Larson just talked about. Uh, the community <laughs> hub at Hillcrest really has two main focus areas. The first is to get families in the building more often making school a place that they want to visit and helping meet some of their non-academic needs. Um, we're doing this through family event nights, um, cr creating a hub space within the building where families can use internet services or laundry or other services that they need. Um, we'd like to extend our flu shots, um, our dental clinic to not just have students in our building, but to their families as well, meeting those needs. Of, um, of the non, you know, the children not at our school. Um, in addition, we'd like to offer summer classes or classes outside of school time to parents or to students um, that are not based in academics that hit the other needs that um, we're not able to meet right now. The second main area is to increase our business partnerships. Uh, Caitlin spoke very highly of our clubs at Hillcrest and that's something we've really enjoyed having. Um, but we really want to extend those partnerships. We were able to get some KU football players into the building last year, and the looks on those kids' faces when they got to come to football club was pretty priceless. So really extending those um, partnerships within the community and um, getting other businesses in the building. Um, back to Christine. Hey, you guys. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about SEL Ride the Momentum. And the reason why we have Ride the Momentum on there is because in the years past, we um, implemented conscious discipline at our school, which is all about brain research, 
making sure you're ready for learning and teaching those SEL skills more to the adult and how to um, get those into the kids. So we have a twofold goal here. Part of that is to create a curriculum that allows us to bring in those different areas like CI3T, conscious discipline, positive action, those different things that we've tried and create more a more cohesive plan that isn't as disjointed as what we've been doing now. Um, and the other part of that is about self-regulation. So we're going to have a get ready room next year for kids to go to when they need space and um, with our counselor to get ready to go back into the classroom as well as a sensory path um, mindfulness all of those are all things that we're working on to help increase the self-regulation skills within our students um, and that is by, beyond the safe place that every classroom and every space in our school has at this time okay and i'm um, joe can you put it on to the next slide please and we'll keep on going Okay, uh, Jessica Larson again, and I have um, a goal area <clears throat> which we've just dubbed common sense grade cards. And really it just means that um, we've had a lot of feedback from families um, that the grade card, while it is based on our standards, it is, uh, it's very wordy, um, it's hard to understand. Um, and so just really looking at ways to make it um, more transparent, more clear cut, um, we'd like to have it, um, um, as you can see in the goal area with some baseline data and really focusing on the growth of the student in progress um, over time. And we've also been talking about how we can um, develop some sort of portfolio to go along with it or for fifth grade, some exit criteria, um, really just as a way to supplement, um, you know, the district grade card. And just making sure that it is as clear and transparent and uh, reader friendly to students and their families. Well, I guess I'll take over from here. Uh, my name is Heather Laughlin. Uh, I teach fifth grade at Hillcrest. And I'm going to talk about test less, test smart, and that's going to go right into instructional alignment. So um, test less and instructional alignment, they, they really go hand in hand. Um, in fact, we realized that one aspect of redesign is that some teams necessarily overlap and we're going to be working together as we go. Uh, the premise for test less, test smart was to really think about effective ways to assess student learning uh, without over testing, which takes away instructional time and can be stressful for students. Um, and we may have started out asking, what can we drop? But as our redesign work evolved, we realized the the test smart aspect was the most important. So we knew certain classroom structural changes uh, would require us to um, have common formative assessments or almost learning checkpoints or dipsticks um, across grade levels, like when we were talking about our two, three band or our four, five band. Um, so this will continue to be part of our PLC work next year. Uh, and we're excited that this is a focus at the district level. Um, we also look forward to engaging um, in more in-depth professional development for how to more effectively use assessments to guide student learning. So on to instructional alignment, um, we consider this to be the, the nuts and bolts or the scaffolding behind the scenes. Um, and this, uh, this committee includes our document work. Um, as a staff, we appreciated the work it took to create a, a district curriculum document. Um, in fact, several of our staff members were, were part of creating it. Um, however, as we dug deeper into uh, what we wanted to do for redesign, we quickly discovered that there's much more PLC planning that needed to happen um, to meet our goals. Um, so our instructional alignment document um, pushes us to collaboratively write our big ideas, essential questions and learning targets, uh, but also plan around things like vocabulary and ELL and AVID and, and other uh, learning strategies, um, available materials and resources, opportunities to connect with special staff and, of course, the community. Um, so, yeah, so we're excited that um, the work uh, about the work that the district is uh, doing um, around these um, standards progression. So, so um, that's it. 
that, uh, that's the background behind our thinking for these two areas. Um, there are several documents um, that are ready to use. We had, um, we've already had a grade level use our master instructional alignment guide for math this spring. Um, and with the upcoming reading training uh, provided by the state, we will finalize the same document for ELA, uh, ELA later next year. Um, this spring, um, we have been piloting the use of instructional menus um, during this continuous learning time. And we're gathering feedback about how that went and this format will be used to personalize student work during independent work blocks during the day um, next year and um, we're we're updating our pbl planning documents to reflect um, elements of redesign and as a pbl trained school um, we intend to continue using that learning approach um, and finally, we um, also plan to incorporate AVID strategies into our instructional alignment um, after being trained this summer or next year. And our final goal area is purposeful professional development. It's basically our goal is to make all of our professional development purposeful, um, spending PD time focused on redesign and spending some of our time before and after school as working as PLCs um, to continue to build and align our instruction to meet the needs of all of these new areas. Um, we have staff working on building a professional development calendar based on staff needs and um, staff goals. Joe, if you can go to the next slide, I believe Nancy is back on. There we go. Um, well, tw spring 2020 has definitely changed the trajectory of the small bets that we thought we would that we were going to try out and presented a unique opportunity to implement much more than we had imagined for everyone. We are all trying redesign in some way or another. Each of our goal areas were able to virtually present to all staff members and receive feedback for further research, which, which we didn't know if we were going to be able to accomplish, but, um, but we were able to all eight or all seven of our, of our areas, all, all of our areas were able to present to each other and then and, and get that feedback from each other. Um, the district's continuous learning plan provided us a space um, to try out and adjust our newly designed instructional menus that Heather was talking about um, in ELA and in math. Um, some of our small bets, like the additional family engagement nights, we're going to have to push, um, push back until fall. Also in the fall, we're, we're going to continue our gap analysis in each one of our goal areas. We're going to continue gathering information and making adjustments as well as um, accountability protocols. As we reflect on our work, particularly this spring, it has been a little less certain. But one thing that we can be sure of is that we at Hillcrest are all, all in it together and our students are better for it. We thank you for um, letting us present and listening to our redesign goals. Thank you. Board members, question. Hey, Melissa, it's Shannon. Um, yeah. Wow, I am just so impressed with all the work that all of the teams um, from each of the schools have done, and I'm so excited to watch this process as it continues to unfold. Um, clearly, you know, everything you had planned to do this spring has been thrown for a complete loop. Um, and with a with a launch date of um, January anticipated, um, what are your next steps in terms of um, approvals from the state and that sort of um, that sort of process? Um, and is there a, a point in time in which um, you all already know that you'll be coming back to our board for another look at this or for future approvals? Just wondering what that schedule looks like. Thanks. Hi, Shannon, this is Anna. It's actually the last slide of our presentation. So <laughs> it's it's your way. Story. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, this fall, as they all talked about, they will make the necessary adjustments just depending on what school looks like and start to continue um, prototyping and testing. And once we know the date for the presentation to KSDE, we will work backwards um, to 
have a report and approval um, for our local uh, Board of Education in the fall. And then in whatever the date is for KSDE, they'll go and report and hopefully get approval there and then launch in January. They haven't released those dates yet. So we're just waiting to um, hear. I imagine if I'm just guessing that it will at least be after the first nine weeks so that they have time to get school started and um, test things out and then have time to report. So I would imagine October, November is when we would probably come back um, because somewhere in there will be the state process and then the launching in January. Great. Um, um, the only thing, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, in follow-up to that, there was some mention of the um, the next Apollo cohort, cohort and I, um, you mentioned that at the beginning. Uh, what, are, what are the state's deadlines um, for participation if we were going to have a middle school or middle schools participating in the Apollo 2 cohort? Um, the vote is, I think it goes to the state July 1. Um, is when you have to uh, submit the application. So we were working with LEA, um, trying to make sure that we can have the vote uh, at the middle schools um, online before the teacher's last day at the middle school. So they're working, um, we're working on what that will look like. Great, thank you. Any more questions, board members? I apologize for my mic. A general question that I could put forward to really any of the schools, but um, I'm thinking about in your, you know, particularly given what Shannon had just said and, and Dr. Stubblefield was explaining in terms of your timeline and how it's it's been a little bit, um, uh, not a little bit, it's been altered due to the uh, pandemic. I'm also wondering about how other initiatives that the school undertakes may interfere with your um, progress and redesign. So oftentimes a um, an, um, new initiative or a um, tweak to uh, existing programming will come before the board and it, it's something that's going to go to like all elementary levels or a certain buildings. As those initiatives come up or there's changes to practices and procedures, how is that, how do you um, negotiate that as a team? How does Dr. Stubblefield work with you around um, like you may maybe not having to uh, adhere to the same uh, requirements as other schools. I'm just wondering in a process way, how are you managing that, um, trying to make changes while changes are happening? Uh, this is Tammy, and I would just say, um, and I think I speak for at least the three elementaries, um, we have requested from the district that we have some dedicated time at our district PD days because um, we don't have a lot of time where we can get staff all together. And I know last spring um, they were working on that for next year, or actually, when was that? I guess our March PD, we were going to have some of that. Um, and then I would also just say um, Hillcrest is going to be an avid school next year, and we actually feel like that's um, been a missing piece of the instructional strategies in our district. So we feel like it marries beautifully into a lot of the um, curriculum and instructional alignment work that we're doing. So I don't see it being conflicting. I see it being a, just a really nice piece that we've been looking for. So in that, in some that those things that support um, uh, work, your current, that inherently support work that teachers do really don't interfere or conflict with new initiatives you may be undertaking as um, educators in your individual building. Is that correct? I think maybe mute, unmute. I, I, I appreciated Tammy's feedback and that was really helpful. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Melissa, I don't, this is Anna. I just was wanted to say as we wrap up that um, one of the things, I know, um, we have a couple of principals retiring, both Brian and Tammy, and we will miss them. But I will say, because this process has so been so collaborative between teachers and administration, 
um, that there are systems in place for the work to move forward. And that is at the heart of redesign with um, teachers being the leaders in the process and collaborating with the administration. So the sustainability and the systems that are in place, um, I feel really good about, and I really appreciate the work that all of our administrators have done in collaborating and working with the teachers. But I just wanted to publicly say thank you to Brian and Tammy for um, leaving both of those buildings in such good shape that um, as we went through the interview process for both of them, the staff really feel secure about being able to move forward with the redesign work. So I just want to publicly say thank you for your leadership. And thank you to your staff for being so collaborative around the process. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. I could just have some uh, final comments. Obviously, I won't um, go over every all the notes that I wrote down. We'll be here mm -hmm. all night. I'm just um, I want to say thank you to all of our um, redesign teams and our staff that presented on tonight. Um, I too hear the excitement in your voice. Um, and, and I know that excitement comes because you have ownership in what school could possibly be. Just as we want students to be, and I heard someone say it tonight, and it's so close aligned to what I say, I'm trying to find it on my notes here. Um, um, gosh, where is it? But I heard someone say something to the effect of um, students being in charge of their own learning. You know, I often say that I want students to be the CEOs of their own learning. And I think when when teachers get together and rethink schools, uh, a model that should have been abandoned years ago, you better watch out. And I thought, and I think you saw that tonight. Uh, I mean, uh, the things that kind of stuck out to me uh, from, from Hillcrest was structures and systems. And I think if we're really going to um, redesign school, we have to look at the structures and systems in place. I heard learning outside of the school day, choice, um, I heard mastery learning competencies. And so I think, I always say everything happens for a reason. I think this was our prelude, <laughs> uh, our test run, as, as, as My uh, Myron said, to what schools could possibly be. And so I just can't wait to uh, see it happen. Uh, it's, uh, I think the great philosopher John Hannibal Smith said, I love, I love it when a plan comes together. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying and loving these plans that are that are coming together because if you think about it, rethinking school is hard, but when you're given the permission to do it, um, it's it, it, it's on. So uh, kudos to all the teams tonight, and I just can't wait to see what happens, and I'm super excited. Great, thank you. Hey Melissa, could I ask one more quick question? Um, this is Shannon. Um, I am just curious whether the teams feel that there's a good uh, process or procedure in place, and Dr. Stubblefield, you, if you want to speak to this as well, um, as you're going through this process in terms of the board's role, and if you are finding barriers either through our policy or through our negotiated agreement, um, do you feel like there is a process in place that those are being addressed or, or that they could be addressed and brought to the board for consideration? Or maybe you haven't run across anything like that, and that's wonderful. But um, it seems that that's something that people often say is that there's there's policies and things that are limiting our schools from doing things that they really want to do. And I just want to make sure that we are um, being proactive about that. Um, Shannon and Kelly Doney or Myron, because we're all on negotiations, can speak to this. There was language put in place around variances to the master agreement or process. So. Like, for example, you may have seen or heard in some of their pre presentations, and may, or maybe all of them, additional planning and collaborative collab time to collaborate. Well, there is a minimum amount of time. So any of those things, there's a process put in place because we do primarily meet or we can meet at any time that whatever they may propose that may be contradictory or not necessarily outlined in the master agreement, there is a process to go for um, the various language. Um, Policy-wise, I don't think anybody has come up with anything, but I think we would just send it to policy would be the plan. But as far as the master agreement, there is a process in place. Okay, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Kelly. 
I think I, I, okay. Again, thank, yes, yes, thank you for that report. Um, we're, Kelly's going to make a, a motion. Uh, we received feedback that a, a patron misunderstood how the patron commentary was to be um, submitted to the board, and I anticipated this would be an issue um, for uh, community members who might not, you know, be following along with all the nitty gritty of how um, they have the opportunity to speak. So um, I know this is not standard, but I'd like to make a motion to allow um, the patron to provide commentary. She has small children and has asked that we that I read it. Um, so with that, uh, do we make space for additional comment or questions, Melissa, before I make the motion? Yes. Uh, do we have any more questions or comments before we move on? Again, thank you to the, the redesign teams and I mean, you're ready. Okay, I move we allow patron commentary that was inadvertently not included due to the uh, virtual meeting format. Second, Ms. Chair. All those in favor, does it, this one is a single vote or all together at least, can you remind me? Yeah, it can be a unanimous voice vote. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, I will read the patron commentary, even though um, Kelly's the individual that will be speaking on behalf of patron. The USD 497 Board of Education welcomes patron comments and thanks you for taking the time to talk to us about our policies and procedures. We set aside time during our regularly scheduled regular me meetings to hear from the public. This is your time to share opinions. However, complaints about specific staff or students will be heard by the board in executive session in order to protect the privacy of the individuals to be discussed. While you are not required to share your contact information, we ask for that information so district staff or the board can follow up with any specific concerns you may have. The board president will invite comments on topics not included on the agenda, typically at the beginning of the meeting. Um, comments relating to agenda items are welcome after the board has had the opportunity to discuss the topic. Um, and we usually have a five minute time limit. So Kelly, whenever you're ready. Uh, the comment is from Justine Flory. She writes, hello, my name is Justine Flory. I have two children in the district attending Prairie Park. I sent each of you an email in the last 24 hours and appreciate any time you spent reviewing it. My concerns are regarding the planned class size increases at Prairie Park. This is apparently an ongoing issue for our school and the district. Last year, fourth grade classes were overcrowded with at least 25 plus students per room. This was remedied for the current school year. We are now leaning, uh, learning that fourth and fifth grade classes teachers will be cut once again. This is incredibly frustrating in regular times, let alone during our current school closures. Next fall, we have 57 fourth graders that will be split between two classes. I find this unacceptable following our current two months of school closure. Our teachers will need additional one-on-one -on -one time with students to bring them back up to grade level standards and then begin teaching new material. I do not feel that any class size of 25 plus is conducive to learning at any time, let alone following a two month school closure. Why isn't this need for additional instruction time being planned for? And more importantly, why aren't we listening to our teachers on the ground saying this is too many children? Why are we creating another obstacle for teachers and students to go back on track this fall? Uh, sincerely, Justine Flory. Um, I I just have a comment about um, how patron commentary is. Yeah, that's what I was going. Um, so I I would like to investigate for our next 
next meeting, how, when um, folks join the meeting, if they haven't gotten the, the um, instructions or they're unaware that they need to contact a lease prior to the meeting, that they have opportunity to either in the chat or some other way request um, that, that we instruct them that they have opportunity to provide feedback so that we're not inadvertently limiting um, uh, patron commentary, which I think could be an ongoing issue if we continue in this virtual format for the next couple months or longer. Yeah, definitely. I was going to say, as we um, maybe that's a matter of like going through the social media and, you know, kind of sending out that reminder, especially as we send out the we have the um, agenda. Um, I cannot remember the date because I'm in agenda setting all the time, but when we put the agenda um, on on the um, website that maybe we should reiterate, like if you have patron. Um, commentary. Definitely, and I think Julie has done a good job of trying to let people know, but for most folks, I think um, that are brave enough to show up at a public meeting and um, explain what's happening for their family or their kids or what they've observed in the district, good or bad, um, we need to make that as easy for them as possible. Yeah, agree. Any? And thank you everyone for um, allowing um, Justine to allow Kelly to read Justine's um, commentary. And if we don't have anything, we can make a motion to adjourn. This is Shannon, so moved. All those in favor? Aye. I think we need a second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll second. Oh, thank you. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you again for your time. Have a good evening and take care of yourselves.